getting into debt and having Order. to go to jail. Senator Billick, we move to questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. New data released today confirms that already stagnant wages growth has slowed even further since the election. Can the minister confirm that today's ABS wages data reveals that annual wage growth has fallen to a low of just 2.2 per cent, and at, 0.5, at just 0.5 per cent, Australian workers experience no real wages growth in the September quarter? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the good news is that uh, wages continue to grow faster than inflation. Wages continue to grow faster than inflation. Because, of Order. course, when Senator Gallagher, when Senator Gallagher uh, in a rather misleading way, seeks to focus on the nominal growth, uh, you know, obviously she ignores the fact that inflation is also low, also comparatively low. And what I, and what I, what I would Order. point out. Uh, what I can confirm is that the wage price index rose by 2.2 per cent through the year uh, to, the, uh, to, the, um, uh, uh, to the September quarter. Private sector wages grew uh, by 2.2 per cent through the year. The private sector WPI, including bonus payments, grew by 2.8 per cent, and public sector wages uh, grew uh, by um, 2.5 per cent. And what I can also confirm is that real wages, real wages grew by 0.6 per cent, higher than the 0.4 per cent through the year when Labor lost government. 0.6 per cent, higher than the 0.4 per cent that when Labor lost government, and is Order. indeed in line with the 20-year average. The 20-year average, the 20-year average of wages growth in Australia is point of real wages growth in Australia is 0.6 per cent. But obviously, uh, when uh, when inflation runs higher, that 0.6 per cent, on average over the long term, uh, obviously, uh, you know, leads to a higher nominal uh, growth figure than it would in the context of the current low inflation environment. I mean, that is uh, very obvious. The situation is stronger than it was uh, under Labor. And I also would m uh, make the point. I would also make the point. I would also make the point that uh, I would also make the point that average weekly ordinary time earnings for full-time adults rose by 3.1 per cent over the past year, the strongest growth in six years. The strongest growth in six years. And on 30 May 2019, as you might recall, the Independent Fair Work Commission announced its decision to increase the national minimum wage rate by 3 per cent from 1 July 2019. Uh, the increase is higher than the economy-wide. Uh, wage growth and indeed um, higher than uh, inflation. And indeed, Order, when Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary uh, question. Thank you, Mr. President. Today's poor wages data is more bad news for hardworking Australians who are working harder and yet going backwards. After more than six years in office, why does the government still have no plan to deal with low wages? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. When we came into government, we inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment, Order. and a rapidly deteriorating budget position. Uh, the unemployment rate is well below where it was headed when we came into government. Employment growth has been incredibly strong, uh, running at about 2.6-2.7 per cent over the last uh, couple of financial years, and 2.5 per cent over the most recent year. Well above well above the 1.8 per cent uh, long-term average. And I would, again, I would again refer to what happened to the lowest, the lowest income earners in Australia under Labor. The lowest income earners under Labor. Order. Three. Senator Cormann, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. The Leader of the Government is working valiantly to ensure he does not respond to the question about why they have no plan to deal with low wages, but it is not re directly relevant to the question asked by my colleague for him to talk about Labor, 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 Labor. You are the Government. What is your plan? That is the question. I, 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 on the point of order, Senator Wong, um, I was listening carefully to the Minister's answer. I think it is in order for a Minister to glance across alternative approaches and other historical context. I, I do believe the majority of his answer he was listening to, I was hearing, was directly relevant, and I call on him to continue. Well, uh, thank you very much. Let me just say again, I reject the basic premise underpinning uh, the question, and that is because wage, real wages growth today is stronger than it was when we came into government. And what I would also point out, that under the previous government, the real minimum wage, the real the lowest, the lowest earners in Australia were, cut, were hit by real wage cuts in three out of six years that Labor was in government. In three out of six years, the lowest income earners in Australia were hit with real wage cuts. And of Order, course, under Senator our Cormann. I'm going to ask for slightly more quiet on my left. I am having trouble hearing the minister. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Australians are struggling. Wheat consumption is being driven by stagnant wages. Household debt is at record highs. Almost two million Australians are underemployed or uh, unemployed, and retail trade has had its worst results since the 1990s recession. When will the Morrison government come up with a genuine plan to restore wages growth that continues to deteriorate under its watch? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely reject the premise of the question. Real wages growth is stronger today than it was in Labor's last year in government. And indeed, we turned a uh, we turned the rapidly rising unemployment rate that we inherited from the Labor Party around uh, with about 1.5 million new jobs created. Workforce participation is the second highest on record. Female workforce participation is the highest on record. The welfare dependency of the working age population is the lowest it's ever been. Uh, but of course, Australia is facing uh, some global economic headwinds. We are dealing with some uh, significant domestic uh, economic headwinds, including, of course, a significant drought in large parts of regional Australia, which are having an impact. And yet, you know what? Australia, the Australian economy continues to grow. We are in our 29th year of continuous growth. We are, if, if, we had, if we had adopted the policy prescriptions of the Labor Party, the socialist, high-taxing, anti-business agenda that Labor took to the last election, the economy today would be weaker, unemployment Order. would be higher, Senator and Senator Cormann, time for the lower. answer has expired. Senator Wong? Uh, Mr President, can I just make the point? Uh, I'm going to All right, I make a point of order that the minister's microphone continued to operate well beyond the clock, and I'd ask that you bring that to the attention of those oh. with the microphone. Oh, I was Thank calling you. the minister. I think you will note I was calling the minister to. Order. 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 Yeah, Senator, well, I was going to respond. I, I was calling the minister to order from the time the clock went to zero. I, you've made the point, which I'm sure the attendants with the microphones will. Order, Senator Wong on the point of order. It's raised. Senator Cormann on the point on, of order. On the point of order, I was just uh, seeking to provide all of the relevant information in a way that is directly order. relevant order. to the question okay, asked. It's going to be one of those days, Senator Wong on the point of order. On the point of order, if he ever outlined a plan to do something about low wages, order. we'd be happy, happy to give him I'm more time, to... but he still doesn't. We'll give you leave now. Order. On the point of order, I was calling the minister to order as I do when the clock hits zero. The point was made by Senator Wong. Uh, if there's less noise in the chamber, I am sure people approaching the clock will actually be able to hear my ruling. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Drought and Rural Finance, Senator McKenzie. Can the minister outline how changes to the farm household allowance benefit and make it easier for farmers experiencing hardship to receive support from the government? Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Drought and Rural Finance, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McMahon, for your, for your question. And I want to thank the Chamber for their support on Farm Household Allowance Bill passed yesterday. Our farmers contribute significantly to our national prosperity, and many, as we know, are suffering the impacts of drought. Today, many of these very same farmers are helping their own communities or in other states with rural fire services to help fight fires, and we want to thank them for their service. It's important to note that with the drought, there is often bipartisan support for measures to assist, and I appreciate the Labor Party and the Greens, Senator Alliance senators and Senator Bernardi and other crossbenchers for their support to give frontline support to drought-affected farmers. Yesterday I met with dairy farmers from Queensland and New South Wales who are experiencing hardship from high input costs of fodder, water and electricity. The Farm Household Allowance works to support farmers in many forms of hardship, whether caused by high input costs, costs drought or needed in the aftermath of the terrible bushfires scorching much of New South Wales and Queensland coast. FHA provides farmers and their families money for basic household necessities while they make decisions about the future of their farm businesses and take action to improve their circumstances with the support with our Rural Financial Counselling Service. The passage of the Farm House Support Amendment Bill yesterday will result in immediate cash being provided to eligible farmers and their families by Christmas and significant radical uh, simplification and expansion 
of the farmers being able to access farm household allowance. We've changed the way we treat uh, off-farm income. We've also changed the, for the first time that farmers generating income from adjustment to have that income considered against their losses. And importantly, it will allow for the minister to make a rule to provide these relief payments to people who have exhausted their first four years on FHA going forward without having to come back to the Senate. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on other measures available to support farmers and communities affected by the drought? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator McMahon. It was great uh, last week to be able to join you to see how the drought uh, was affecting the Barclay cattlemen, who have been destocking uh, for the last 18 months. In addition to the FHA, our government has committed over $8 billion of measures to support farmers, their families and rural and regional communities get through the drought and to support them well into recovery. We've always sought to provide support in the here and now. Uh, that includes the rural financial counselling services, the uh, mental health services, concessional loans and for the first time in this package to be available to regional small businesses to help them uh, with that interest cost and cash flow issues over the next two years. Secondly, we've got a range of programs for communities to keep people employed in our rural and regional communities. A drought-specific BBRF round, $200 million. Uh, as well as 100 gigalitres of water for farmers to help farmers by growing more fodder, which will also help uh, with those northern farmers. And thirdly, it is about the Order, future Senator and McKenzie. resilience. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How is the Liberal and Nationals government building resilience against future droughts? And is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we've seen clearly over the last couple of days the horrific impact that drought combined with fires is having on our communities across New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and WA. Our government believes that agriculture has a very bright future in this country and we want to ensure that our regional communities are vibrant places where people want to come and live and work. So we're supportive of that positive future. A $5 billion future drought fund providing sustainable and ongoing uh, much needed cash to support communities and farmers prepare for the next drought uh, with resilience programs, $3.3 billion in funding for water projects, yes, to build dams, to have assist farmers with on-farm water infrastructure and to build the weirs and pipelines so that we can actually get water from where it falls to where it's actually needed to grow safe, sustainable, nutritious food, not just for us but the world. We've got farm management deposit schemes to help our farmers prepare for the future. We will continue to stand with them through this drought and well Order, into recovery. Senator McKenzie, Senator Wong. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. On the same day record low growth for Australians under this government is again confirmed, Morrison government MPs, including the member for Goldstein, the member for McKellar and the member for Hughes, Mr Wilson, Mr Falinski and Mr Kelly, have all lined up to publicly criticise the Reserve Bank. Given the Morrison government continues to refuse to heed the advice of the Reserve Bank, to stimulate the economy, including by bringing forward vital infrastructure investment, can the minister advise just when this government will stop criticising the RBA and start heeding its advice? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I comprehensively reject the premise of the question. Uh, firstly, well, order. 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 Can I hear the minister? Uh, f firstly, the government does not uh, comment on monetary policy decisions of the Reserve Bank. Yes, we respect. We respect. We respect. Order. 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 On my left, there is an opportunity for supplementary questions and debate after question time. Senator Cormann. We, we respect the independence of the Reserve Bank. It is the Reserve Bank. Order. I, I'm going to. We are going to waste time in question time, which is a forum for non-government parties. I will, I will call the minister when there's silence. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, uh, firstly, firstly, we respect the independence of the Reserve Bank, and of course, we respect 
to the fact that it's their job to determine uh, monetary policy settings based on their assessment of the economic information uh, and data and relevant consideration uh, that they, of course, appropriately pursue. I would also make the point uh, that the Australian government is pursuing a pro-growth economic strategy enshrined in our budget, enshrined in our budget, which was Order. in stark contrast with the alternative uh, policies taken to the last election by the alternative government, which was delivering uh, a socialist, anti-business, high-taxing agenda, which would have weakened the economy, which would have cr uh, created uh, more unemployment, and which would have led to lower wages. Uh, we have, since the election, of course, uh, legislated another $158 billion worth of income tax relief, which takes uh, the level of income tax relief legislated over the last two years to more than $300 billion. More than $23 billion of that has been returned Order. to the pockets of hardworking Australians uh, since the middle of July. And indeed, we continue to implement a very ambitious uh, infrastructure investment program with our $100 billion federal investment uh, infrastructure infrastructure investment uh, pipeline. And indeed, and indeed uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, let, me, let me reassure, let me reassure uh, Senator Wong uh, and all senators that the government continues to absolutely uh, work. Uh, the fiscal policy absolutely uh, continues to uh, run in the same direction as monetary policy. Uh, and we are very, Order very, on my left. And, and you know, we, we are very, very respectful of the Reserve Bank. Order. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank, thank Thank you, Mr. President. The IBA cuts the minister's colleagues are lining up to criticise, and I refer him to their public statements, lining up to criticise, are a direct result of the economy's weakness under this government and the coalition's failure to provide complementary fiscal stimulus, as the IBA has called for on multiple occasions. Can the minister explain why his colleagues are so anxious to criticise the RBA instead of, doing, instead of the government doing its job, and that is to take action to turn the economy around? Order. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely uh, reject the premise of that question. Un under our government, the Australian economy continues to grow. The Australian economy continues to grow at a time uh, when uh, other economies around the world, in the June quarter, for example, we're shrinking. We're shrinking. Uh, our economy in the June quarter was growing at a half a percent. And here's the Labour Party saying the sky is about to fall in. You know what? I mean, in the UK, in Germany, in South Korea, in Singapore, the economies were shrinking. There are a few global economic headwinds uh, that, we are, that we are dealing with as a globally focused open trading order. economy. Order. Senator Cormann, Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order, direct relevance. The question is not about the Labour Party. The question is about why the government is ignoring the RBA. Why is the government ignoring, ignoring the Reserve Bank of Australia? That is the question. Um, uh, while the minister did mention the Labor Party, I believe at the point you, you raised the point of order just then, Senator Wong, he was talking about other matters which are directly relevant to the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me say it very succinctly uh, for Senator Wong. Uh, we respect uh, the. Uh, Senator, I'm going to ask for some silence on my left and leadership from those along the front benches. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, we respect the independence of the Reserve Bank to set monetary policy, uh, and we have, are responsible for setting fiscal policy. And the Australian people, the Australian people endorsed our uh, agenda going to the last election. They rejected Order yours, and we left. still can't get over it. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain why the Morrison government continues to ignore calls from the International Monetary Fund, the Reserve Bank of Australia, state and territory governments and business groups, including the Australian Industry Group, for bringing forward targeted and measured stimulus to support the economy? When will the government finally take action to protect Australians who are struggling with a stagnant economy and record low wage growth? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Again, I reject the premise of the question. We don't have uh, real wages growth is higher than it was uh, during the last year of the Labor government. So the proposition that real wages growth is at a record low is just, it's just completely, and utterly misleading, is mis completely and utterly misleading the public. And furthermore, we went to the last election with a plan to grow the economy, to deal with the uh, challenges that we knew were coming our way. We are implementing our pro-growth budget. We'll provide an update on that pro-growth budget in a half-yearly 
a budget update in December. We will continue to make uh, decisions in an orderly fashion. Uh, we will not ever uh, pursue the sort of cash splashes that the Labor Party recklessly and irresponsibly pursued uh, in government. Recklessly and irresponsibly pursued in government. We are not going to. We are not going to force. Uh, schools to accept school halls they didn't need. We are not going to put pink butts into people's houses, setting their houses on fire, only then to spend another billion dollars taking those pink butts out again. We will continue to make sensible decisions, implementing Order. our plan to build a stronger economy, a more resilient Order, economy Senator and create more Senator jobs. Senator Dinatale. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, my question is to Minister McKenzie, representing the Minister for Natural Disasters and Emergency Management. Minister, Aaron Crow from Warrawilla on the New South Wales mid-north coast, whose house is now in ashes, told the media yesterday, and I quote, in this bucket is my house. When is the time to talk about climate change then if I'm standing in the wreckage of my own home? Minister, what is your answer to Mr Crow's question? The Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Di Natale. Great to have you back with us. Um, and as you will have noticed, this whole week this parliament has been moved with Australians who are suffering through the most catastrophic bushfire event that our nation has seen. And we know that Australians have lost their lives. Hundreds of Australians are without a home, having lost all their uh, worldly belongings, their family photo albums, uh, etc. And as I've said uh, in this place earlier on in this week, and others have too, uh, Senator Wong and Senator Cormann, now is not the time to be debating policy. We need to be very careful as leaders in our community to politicise what is one of the most catastrophic bushfire seasons in living memories. Fires are caused by a variety of factors, climate change, drought, which makes the fuel load drier and more combustible, and fuel management, which we know when we're looking after our natural resources, whether it be uh, our state or national parks, our state and territory governments have to uh, get those practices right. Um, we need to make sure that you know, scientists and firefighters have made it clear that these are the areas that we need to address as a community so that we can address the severe impacts and the risks uh, that this provides to our broader uh, Australian community uh, now and into the future. Senator Dinatale, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Gemma Pleasman lost her family's houses on their property near Grafton, and she said, and again I quote, we've never experienced anything like this. People who are struggling to survive want everyone to know this is a climate emergency. Minister, do you hear Ms Blesman's pleas, and do you acknowledge that we are indeed in a climate emergency? Senator McKenzie. Well, absolutely. Uh, I acknowledge the horrific circumstances uh, that Gemma has found herself in and hundreds of Australians in New South Wales and Queensland have found themselves in this week and, if the weather reports are true, will continue to find themselves in uh, in coming weeks. Local MPs are on the ground right now uh, in evacuation centres comforting and supporting their communities however they are. We've got volunteers and paid. Uh, firefighters, not just from these home states but from right around the country and internationally, assisting our communities to deal with these horrific oh, fires. Sorry, Senator but to come point here of order. And just a, Senator just a point, point, of order. point of order on relevance. The question uh, was very narrow. Uh, I did ask whether uh, the minister acknowledged Ms Plesman's pleas that we're in a climate emergency. I just point to that specific aspect of the question, which was indeed the entirety of the question. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Senator Di Natale. On this issue, I was giving ministers and people around the chamber through the course of the week some liberality, given the sensitivity of the matter, but you've reminded the minister of the specific nature of your question. I call the minister to continue. Thank you very much. And Senator Di Natale, as I've said in this chamber many times in response to yours and your party's uh, questions, I accept the science of climate change. So does the, our government, which is why we have a raft of measures 
uh, to actually bring down emissions, meet our international commitments and ensure that we do everything we can to keep Australia Order, safe. Senator McKenzie. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Um, well, Benjamin Huey, he evacuated his house at Great Mackerel Beach. He described himself as a conservative, actually, but he said that the bushfires are encouraged by climate change. Indeed, he said, and I quote, a conservative would want to be sure, would want to be safe and would want to take action before it happens. Order. So you're not just lying back and going, oh, here it comes. Minister, do you accept that it's time to take action on climate change, which means having a plan to phase out coal, oil and gas and replace it with renewable energy? Senator McKenzie. Well, order thank you very much. Order on my left and right, Senator McKenzie. Oh. <laughs> not, your, not order for you, order for others interjecting. Oh, Senator, OK. Well, I'm, I'm just very sensitive to that, uh, Mr President. Um, well, Senator Di Natale, I, I don't know how often I can stand up and say this. I know it doesn't fit your narrative of me or my party or this side of the chamber, that we accept the science of climate change and have got real and practical initiatives to reduce emissions across the country, from the $10 million we're providing to dairy farmers to actually renovate uh, their electricity costs and get into the renewable market, to the $3.5 billion climate reductions fund that we have to help small businesses and communities uh, to actually reduce their emissions so that we can do our part as a nation uh, and meet our international commitments uh, under the Paris Agreement. The horrific tragedies you've outlined for the Senate today really reflect everything we've been talking about for the last three days, uh, which is standing with our regional communities who are having, being impacted by these horrific and catastrophic events and standing up for Order, our rural McKenzie. firefighters. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the government is supporting the education of children impacted by the drought? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Hughes very much for your question. Uh, of course, I know this brings together uh, issues very important and dear to your heart in terms of support for rural and regional Australian communities uh, and, of course, support for all Australian school children to be able to access a quality yeah. education. Uh, and the Morrison government firmly believes that every Australian child, no matter where they live, no matter their circumstances, should have access to a world-class education, be that early education, school education or tertiary education. That's why we continue to provide record funding for early childhood education and childcare. Some $8.6 billion this year, growing through to $9.9 billion by 2021-22. It's why we're providing record funding for Australian schools, some $310 billion over the next 10 years, an increase of 62 per cent per student. And it's why we're providing record funding for Australian universities, some $17.7 billion in this year alone. We know that in these difficult times of drought that Australian communities stand together and support one another. Uh, Australian schools lend a hand and support one another, and as a government, we stand firmly in support of those communities and those schools as well. It's why we've worked to provide additional special circumstances funding in a number of targeted ways over the course of this year, initially providing some $4 million in special circumstances funding, particularly for schools affected by floods in North Queensland, but earlier this month now extending that, providing $10 million in special circumstances funding to support schools facing financial hardship as a result of the ongoing drought conditions affecting much of Australia, in particularly much of New South Wales, uh, where you come from, Senator Hughes. Uh, this is important support for schools, for the families and those students in terms of providing additional practical assistance that complements the type of drought measures that Senator McKenzie was outlining to the chamber earlier and is all part of the comprehensive approach our government Order. is taking to Senator responding Birmingham. to the drought. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Can the minister explain how this funding will make a significant difference to the schools and the families that they serve? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, as we know, communities, families, schools and their students are all affected uh, by drought. Uh, and those school communities themselves play a very valuable part in supporting students and families, in helping them through uh, the stresses and the tough times that come with these circumstances. Some schools offer fee concessions, discounts. Others have had to step up financial assistance, counselling or counselling services to individual students. 
Uh, and the funding that we are providing is intended to help ensure uh, that schools remain uh, financially viable, uh, that students who need it are supported uh, with additional counselling services, uh, that assistance is there uh, for families in drought-affected areas in terms of fee relief where they need it, uh, all of which complements other programs such as the Assistance for Isolated Children scheme, uh, which provides targeted assistance to support families in rural and regional Australia. Uh, and we're applying this program in a way, seeking applications from schools in drought-affected areas to make sure the dollars Order. flow to those Senator who need it most. Uh, final supplementary question. Thank you. How will government funding for early learning centres support families impacted by the drought? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, in addition to the childcare subsidy our government provides, uh, families and services in rural and regional remote areas benefit uh, from the Community Child Care Fund part of our government's child care safety net. The Community Child Care Fund program delivers a total of $327 million over five years to around 980 services, of which some $224 million has been allocated to more than 480 services in regional and remote parts of Australia. And earlier this month, the Morrison government announced that a further $5 million is being made available from the Community Child Care Fund to especially in targeted support for early learning centres that cater for children aged from zero to five who attend centres in drought-affected areas. Now, where a service is experiencing decreased demand or financial pressure due to droughts conditions, they're eligible to apply for special circumstances grant up to $10,000 under a streamlined process to ensure funds are quickly available on the ground, Order. enabling them to better the support their expired. families. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. Senator Mackenzie. In a deal with One Nation, the minister has finally released the draft dairy code of conduct for consultation. The minister's national colleagues have been left fuming, with one complaining to the minister, and I quote, Order. she can deliver for Hanson, but she can't deliver for us. And another colleague has said, and I quote, We've been busting our asses on dairy, holding the line because we were told it couldn't be done, and then Hanson rolls out and claims the whole bloody lot. Why did it take One Nation to get the minister to bring forward the release of the Dairy Code of Conduct? On order, before I, before I, call, the minister, before I call the minister, I did hear some interjections about language. The precedent ha has been adopted generally is that if something has been used in Hansard repeatedly, uh, it is not going to be ruled out of order. Um, I would encourage all senators, however, that just because it has been used doesn't necessarily mean it's appropriate or for the dignity of the chamber to keep using. Senator Bernardi, on a point of order. Um, Mr President, I'm not sure that some of the language used in that question has been used repeatedly in Hansard. I, mean, I obviously, Senator Bernardi, do not have the facility to check that as we speak. I have, however, been asked about words of that calibre previously, and they have been in the Hansard for decades. My view is that where something has not been ruled out of order previously, unless it is egregious, it's not for the chair to change a standing precedent. Um, however, as I urge all senators, just because something has been done doesn't necessarily mean it is great for the dignity of the chamber to do it again. Senator Bernardi? Mr President, I won't, I won't labour the point, oh, but, but some of the language used in that question has been ruled out of order by temporary chairs in the past. And secondly, order. Order. Can I hear Senator Bernardi, please? Senator and Bernardi. And secondly, I, it may have been your ruling previously that just quoting, what? quoting bad language, because someone else has said, I think it was in respect to Senator Cash, was not an appropriate excuse or rationale. Uh, for and using I, it I in was very term. aware of my predecessor's ruling on that matter, which uh, was in 2017, which is why I referred to sort of, shall we say, more egregious language. I would describe that language as, potential, as interpreted by most people to be of more substantially more offensiveness than what I. Than, than what people are objecting to in that question. I ask senators to use their discretion. Uh, Senator O'Neill, uh, you, you stood before. I, I do, um, Mr President, and in my defence, I would have to say that I'm hardly known for using this sort of terminology in general parlance. 
Order. However, the question, the question remains Order. a very accurate representation of the outrage within the and National Party, and I, I think Senator it should O'Neill, stand. This is not a time for editorialising. I gave you an opportunity to defend yourself. Um, can I ask all senators to keep that in mind? If, Senator Bernardi, you are correct and it hasn't been in Hansard repeatedly, I will actually come back to the chamber, but my guess is that that is not the first time it has been used. Senator Mackenzie, the Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator O'Neill, for your question. The National Party is standing with our nation's dairy farmers ad nauseum. As we've, we've debated uh, through question time this week, uh, we're very, very proud to be the only party that took to the Senator election Ayres. what the dairy farmers in this country wanted. They came together and voted as one for a mandatory dairy code on the back of the ACCC inquiry that we called, that we actually followed up on, the ACCC recommendation to deliver a dairy code. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. I think Senator Mackenzie is mistakenly answering the question she was asked yesterday. This is an entirely different question that asks her to reveal to the, the parliament, to, real, to re reveal to this chamber, why Senator Hanson and One Nation were able to get the minister to bring forward the release of the dairy code when her own colleagues could Senator not achieve that outcome. Senator O'Neill, um, with respect, your question had a substantial preamble, and I believe the minister is being directly relevant to the question that was asked. I can't instruct her how to answer a question. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Senator O'Neill. We took to the election, putting in a mandatory code for the dairy industry, should we win the election. We did. So dairy farmers who uh, with the Labor Party put forward a floor price, Joel had a whole suite of initiatives that he was going to do. They didn't want that. They wanted the mandatory dairy code of conduct and a whole raft of measures that we committed to. Uh, legal and financial advice within the ACCC, uh, support for energy efficiency grants, etc. etc. I've, I've, I've run through them publicly several times. That code was not to be delivered until 1 July next year. On winning the election, we took, as a government, as a party, every step to actually bring forward the release of the Dairy Code. And I actually wrote to my department on, in August, seeking, on the back of the lobbying from my own party members, to uh, bring forward the code. And we, so the department and the Office of Parliamentary Counsel were doing everything they could to turn the nine principles that were agreed by industry into a legal document, and the exposure draft that's out for consultation now with the in industry was produced. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Nationals member for Lyme, Dr Gillespie, warned the minister's draft code dudded farmers and called for farmers to be allowed to trade milk, refusing to rule out a leadership tilt over the issue. Why did it take a threat to her leadership for the minister to consider this measure for farmers? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my colleague David Gillespie uh, represents a certain cohort of dairy farmers uh, in the central coast of New South Wales and ha has an innovative uh, trading platform concept for dairy farmers to trade their milk. Now, that particular concept wasn't raised in the consultations we'd had with farmers uh, previously, prior to the election, and so that is why, if you have a, have a chance, I'd recommend you go to the Have Your Say uh, place on the department's website around the Dairy Code, because we're consulting not only on the code but on this innovative approach to trading platforms for milk products uh, that uh, Mr Gillespie absolutely raised. So we're going out, as we should, consulting with our eight dairying regions across the country to see what they think of these issues, and then that will be fed into uh, the code once we complete consultations. I think it's on the 22nd of November. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much. And I, I just note that Dr Gillespie's uh, seat is actually further north from the central coast, on the um, mid-north coast where the fires were raging. One of the minister's national colleagues said it was a waste of time contacting the minister because she never gets back to you, while another said, and I quote, she couldn't organise a piss-up in a brewery. 
Is the minister confident she retains the support of the Nationals Party room? I'm glad my order, my, my request lasted one question. Um, I think that, uh, that word has been used. I'll check that again for you, <laughs> Senator Bernardi. Senator, order, all right. Order. Uh, are we, are we, can we settle down on my left, please? Order. I'll come, to, I'll come to you next, Senator Patrick. Senator Rennick was on his feet first. Senator Rennick. If I could use that word in my maiden speech and you said I couldn't. <laughs> so you're going to have to. Oh. You're going to have to make her attract that. Um, Senator, I, I won't go into my order. Can I actually answer the question first? I can, I, yeah, on the point of order, OK. Point of order. I just wondered if it's possible to give an extension of time on a point of order. So, Senator, <laughs> I'm not going to go into my private conversations with colleagues other than, given you raised it, Senator Rennick, I, I think I recommended against its use. Um, I did actually given order order I, mean, I I'll come to you in a second Senator Patrick I did say and the context of first speeches is also that they avoid contentious elements given the courtesy extended by all senators in the chamber and I did go through that with an explanation I'm going to choose that word uh, check that word I'm certain it's been used before uh, if not I'll come back and ask the senator withdraw to withdraw but can I ask senators to show some discretion in the use of their language and maybe allude to terms that some in the public might find offensive or inappropriate for the decorum of a parliamentary chamber. Senator Patrick. Uh, so I'm coming to you next. Senator Patrick was on his feet first. Thank you, Mr President. I'll just point out that that word was used by Senator Hanson Young uh, either yesterday or the day before in the chamber, and she was asked to withdraw, and she did. Order. Well, I wasn't in the chamber at the time. I will check. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Can I make again the distinction between the use of the word as an expression of my own and the use of reported speech a, of a member yes, of the, but members was, of the minister's own party? Senator O'Neill, please resume your seat. It doesn't set order. There is a ruling by Senator Parry on the use of very contentious language. Um, with respect to quoting, I believe it was a court case or a transcript at the time, on a highly contentious issue. And Senator Parry ruled that when it came to that particular language, quotation of something does not make something parliamentary. Now, I will check whether that word is parliamentary. It was worse, and that's why I used the term egregious language, Senator O'Neill. Um, I will check the use of this term, but can I ask, this problem doesn't arise if senators don't use it and maybe use other words to allude to it rather than use words that set the chamber off. Some self-restraint is not a bad idea in the chamber. Senator, Senator Pratt, you want it on the point of order. Well, uh, point of clarification, Chair, on the point of order. I, I, didn't, I must have missed something in the debate and I haven't heard what word it is that you were uh, <laughs> referring to. Mr President, are you able to put it on the record for us? I'm not going to put it on the record. People can go back and look at the video if they wish. Senator Wish Wilson. Just Order. A point of clarification, Chair. Uh, having been through this myself uh, in pre previous years, isn't the context, the context of the word important in terms of your deliberation rather than the use of the word? Um, Senator Parry's ruling, to paraphrase it, was that quotation of unparliamentary language does not make it parliamentary, and that was a particularly offensive term, if I recall correctly. Um, context does matter. Um, I don't think this word has been ruled unparliamentary before. I will check that. If it is, I'll come back to the chamber. As I've said, my view is that if a word has been used and other presidents have allowed it, if the chamber wants to express its view that it's unparliamentary, I'll enforce it, but I'm not going to make a unilateral ruling on a word that has been used. But can I repeat my plea? This problem doesn't arise if senators don't use the language. We, an allusion can be made to language without necessarily quoting it, and we don't have this distraction. Now I'll come to Senator McKenzie, I think, or on the answer to the suppl final supplementary question. Can get up. Um, look, we're interested in actually delivering a dairy code for the dairy industry to strengthen their power against the egregious uh, behaviour 
of processes. That's what our party is interested in doing. So, you know, in terms of any events that I may or may not have the capacity to hold, uh, the unmentionable bet. I, I do give this uh, give this uh, commitment to the chamber that it will be an open bar and an open invitation for all. Thank you, <laughs> Senator Bragg. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Employment. Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is supporting small and family businesses to grow and prosper? Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. Uh, Senator Bragg and I had the opportunity to visit Settlement Services International uh, recently, and uh, we met with a number of refugees who have come to Australia uh, and, with the support of government, are now running their own very successful small and family businesses. Uh, Mr President, the government understands the value of small and family businesses to the Australian economy, and we understand that when you back small and family businesses, you help them to prosper, to grow and, of course, to create more jobs for Australians. But you've got to get the policy environment right. And uh, implementing higher taxes, I can Order assure you, left. is not one of those policy environments that we want to be in. On this side of the chamber, we have successfully lowered the tax rate for small and family businesses from 30 per cent to 27.5 per cent, and we know it will go down to 25 per cent in 2021-2022. Uh, but we're also addressing the issue of access to finance for small and family businesses with our $2 billion securitisation fund, and we have also committed to an Australian business growth fund. What this will do is provide long-term equity funding to small businesses. We also know, though, that uh, being paid on time is of a priority for small and family businesses. And we are taking the lead as the government uh, in relation to this. And as of the 1st of July this year, the government is paying invoices up to the value of a million dollars within 20 days. But the finance minister uh, and myself has recently announced that as of 1st of January 2020, Commonwealth government agencies will start paying e-invoices within five days, Mr President, within five days, or if we don't, we will pay interest on any late payments. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. What action is the government taking to create new opportunities for Australian small and family businesses? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you very much. And of course, building on our job creating policies, we're also committed to creating new markets and new opportunities for Australian small businesses. Uh, as both uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Defence know, we have a $200 billion investment in Australia's defence capability, and this is providing enormous opportunities for small and family businesses. Uh, we recently held in our Perth, Western Australia, a Defence Industries Summit, where a number of small businesses came along to hear about the opportunities that they are able to get involved in. There are around 3,500 SMEs in the Australian defence industry, and they employ around 30,000 hard-working Australians. What this government is doing, though, to ensure that these businesses have every opportunity to benefit from our investment is we're ensuring a level of Australian industry content in all new defence procurements above $4 million. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Minister, how is supporting small business integral to supporting a strong economy? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, there are around 3.4 million small and family businesses in Australia. They employ around 6 million Australians. It's critical to support these businesses because if we want to grow our economy, uh, we need to ensure that we put in place the right policies for them to prosper and grow and ultimately create more jobs for Australians. Uh, you don't just though, support the small business itself. Uh, you ensure that that small business is able to support its employees. Those employees, of course, they have families, which are then in turn supported. Uh, anyone from rural and regional Australia would know that small businesses are the lifeblood of local communities. Often the local football club is supported by a small business. Uh, 
sponsoring the local football club can never be underestimated, but also supporting small businesses to take on their first apprentice. We on this side of the chamber understand you need to put in place the right policy framework so small businesses can prosper, grow Order, and Senator create Cash. more Senator jobs. Bernardi. <clears throat> uh, my home, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. My home state of South Australia currently has an unemployment rate of 6.3 per cent, which is higher than the national average. I have been speaking to a number of people who are desperately trying to get into the job market and are finding it very difficult. Whilst I acknowledge the government's job active system has some high performing providers, it also has a number of dodgy providers who have been milking the system without providing effective outcomes. When will the government take meaningful action to stop these dodgy providers preying on vulnerable job seekers at taxpayers' expense? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I do thank Senator Bernardi for some notice uh, of this question. Um, the Australian government is, of course, committed, uh, and we're very proud to be committed uh, to getting Australians off welfare and into work. And one of the ways that we do that is through our world-class employment services system. What this system does is help prepare Australians uh, for meaningful and sustainable work opportunities. Uh, Senator Bernardi, the government's principal uh, employment services is known as Job Active. And, uh, if you compare it to the former contract, Job Services Australia, Job Active is delivering more 26-week outcomes uh, at a lower cost. Recently, Job Active received, uh, achieved 1.5 million job placements uh, from July 2015 to October 2019, and it continues to achieve around 1,000 job placements per day. Uh, you referred to the integrity of Job Active providers. Uh, I can assure you the government is committed to the integrity of Job Active providers, and uh, we expect a very high level of service for their clients. Each provider is given a star rating. This star rating is publicly available, so a job seeker can actually go online, go onto the department's website, and they are able to compare providers. The most recent star ratings results showed 90 per cent of employment regions have one or more sites with the highest possible rating of five stars. And the best performing sites are actually spread across regional and metropolitan Australia. Uh, Senator Bernardi, if a provider is not performing, and I welcome any feedback in that regard, um, then the department can actually take away uh, their, some of their market share and reallocate it to a provider that is a high-performing provider. Uh, that way we are ensuring that only the best providers Order, are Senator in the Cash. market. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, I met recently with a young man. I will call him Paul, who has been unemployed for some time. He informed me that under Job Active he's referred to as Stream C, which I understand means he needs the most support to get work. He says that he feels job active his Job Active provider is not supporting him with the services he needs, given the barrier he faces, and is simply interested in ticking the bureaucratic box in order to get their money from the government. Given the government is says it's committed to getting young people like Paul off welfare Order, and into work, Senator Bernard, what is the government the question doing to help has people expired. like Paul? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, um, Senator Bernardi. There is flexibility in the system uh, for job seekers uh, like your constituent, Paul. Uh, providers themselves have access to what is called an employment fund. Uh, it is a fund that is obviously set up by the government, and what this fund is able to do is to ensure that the particular job seeker, and in this case it's a Stream C job seeker, as you've said or you've identified, they actually have the most barriers out of all uh, of the job seekers, uh, the provider is able to ensure that this particular job seeker will get the tailored support that they need to get off welfare and into work. But what we're also doing as a government uh, is we're actually transforming uh, employment services to ensure that we deliver better outcomes for job seekers and employers and a better system for providers. We are redesigning the system so that Stream C job seekers like Paul uh, have access to the most opportunities to move from Order, welfare— Senator Cash. Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Mr President, Minister, Paul tells me he's not happy with his job active provider. 
He wants to move to a provider that is closer to his home and one that is more interested in helping him rather than helping themselves. He's worried that he's going to be penalised if he does this. Is this true? And what do I say to Paul, who just wants to get into the job workforce? Senator Cash. Uh, well, in the first instance, I can assure you uh, that no job seeker is penalised for wanting to move provider. And in fact, the transparency of the five-star rating system ensures that a job, a, a job seeker is able to go online, compare their providers, and if they want to, if they see that there's a better provider, or if they want to move because another provider is closer to where they are located, they are able to do this. Um, and at the same time, they are then entitled to the same level of service. So you can absolutely go back to uh, your constituent and advise them that they are able to transfer. There are mechanisms available to the constituent in the event uh, that they do want to. They can call the department's national customer service line and the department will actually assist them in changing over providers. And again, um, they will ensure that if they do want to change providers uh, or they identify that they're not quite sure which provider they can go to, that assistance will be given and there is no Order, penalty. Senator Cash. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Corrected evidence to Senate estimates has confirmed that, under the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program, the former minister, Senator McKenzie, personally approved funding uh, for her, her own preferred projects that were not recommended by Sport Australia. Right. How, many, how many and which grants did Senator McKenzie personally approve against the advice of her agency? The Minister for Sport and Youth, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I indicated to the Chamber yesterday, uh, every project that was approved by Minister McKen McKenzie under her then responsibilities as Minister for Sport, uh, qualified under the guidelines of the program that was being run. Every project. Order, Mr. President. Order on my left. And as, and as the delegate. Order on my left, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and as the delegate responsible for approval of projects under that program, Minister Mackenzie had the responsibility to approve every project that she approved. That was the role. And, Mr President, uh, as a minister with delegation to approve those projects, that was the role that she undertook, quite reasonably and quite rightly. It's, it, it is Minister, it was Ms. Minister Mackenzie's decision to approve the projects. That was her responsibility. Order, Senator Farrell. On point of order, Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Farrell. Um, President, I've given the minister more than a minute to answer the question. We're talking about the grants that were not recommended by Sports Australia, which the minister approved. Um, You've, you've highlighted that part of the question. I think as long as the minister is talking about the approval of projects, I am going to rule it directly relevant and remind senators of the opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. It doesn't matter whether the opposition likes it or not. The responsibility for the approval of every project under, under the program was the responsibility of Minister Mackenzie as in her role at the time. That was, that was her role. And as I have said a number of times today and yesterday, a minister has that responsibility, takes that responsibility, uses that responsibility when they sign off on, their, on contracts or projects under any program. And as I've said before, every, every project Every single project approved under that program met the guidelines for the program. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. I do have a supplementary question. Uh, Senator Mackenzie's office told the ABC it did not keep records of the program, referring those questions to Minister Colbeck's office, which then referred, which then referred questions back to Senator Mackenzie's office. Ah. When, when will the government come clean? When will the government come clean about how many millions of taxpayers' dollars 
Senator Mackenzie gave to her, her, to her preferred projects Order. rather than those Senator recommended Farrell, by time for Sports the answer. Australia. A question has expired. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank you, Senator Farrell, for the question. Mr. President, Minister Mackenzie used her responsibilities to approve projects that met the guidelines for the project for the program. It's quite it's that simple. That was her responsibility. That was her delegation under the guidelines of the program, uh, and therefore approved each project that was that met the guidelines uh, in accordance with her delegation. That was her responsibility. That was her role under the program. Uh, and that's the role that she undertook. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. So I do have a final supplementary uh, question, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister guarantee to the Senate that all recipients under the program were awarded funds in line with the Commonwealth grants, rules, and guidelines? And what action, if any, has he taken to ensure this? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as I've said a number of times already, every project approved by Minister Mackenzie uh, under the guidelines for that project met a program met the guidelines for the program as the delegate Senator for Wong on a point of order yeah point of order of direct relevance the question is actually not about program guidelines it is the broader procurement guidelines which is a separate question I'd ask that the minister return to that issue you, you reminded the minister of that Part of that question. Um, he's been speaking for 17 seconds, and I'll give him an opportunity to continue. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, Minister Mackenzie was the delegate to approve projects under the program. She expended her responsibilities to approve projects under the program, uh, as was her responsibility and as she was entitled to do as the delegate order. under the program. Senator Farrell, on a point of order. <laughs> Yes, point of order. If Senator Mackenzie or Senator Colbert have nothing to hide, can they please answer the question directly? Um, I can't instruct the minister how to answer the question. Um, I'm listening carefully. Have you concluded? Sen Senator Colbeck has concluded. Senator Cormann was seeking the call. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Oh. Oh. Order. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Pursuant to Standing Order 164.3, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment as to why an order for production uh, for documents number 91 relating to a PFAS report has not been complied with. So I'm, I can't see who's seeking the call. Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President, and uh, um, uh, thank Senator Patrick for his question. Uh, as, uh, as I informed the chamber only a couple of weeks ago, the government welcomed the report of the parliamentary inquiry into the management of PFAS contamination in and around defence bases, as we welcome any opportunity to identify potential improvements to uh, the way the government uh, continues to respond to this uh, complex issue. PFAS contamination is indeed a complex issue requiring uh, an effective evidence-based and nationally consistent response uh, and agencies of government have been working cooperatively uh, and in close consultation with communities and other stakeholders as we seek to do so. A whole of government response to the Senate uh, report uh, is being finalised and will be tabled as soon as possible. Uh, our intent is to have this finalised uh, before the end of this year. Senator Patrick. So I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's uh, explanation. I would like to, uh, to uh, say to the Minister that uh, this report is a very important report uh, that, that goes to an issue that affects people in multiple states and, as the Minister knows, affects people in South Australia in and around uh, the Edinburgh Air Force Base. I know that my uh, Senate colleagues, uh, Senator Faruqi and McCarthy, will, will say something perhaps uh, in relation uh, more specifically to the report, but I, I do remind uh, the government that the Senate has resolved that uh, reports of committees should be responded to within three months. 
this is a joint report, uh, and I note that the House has a rule that says six months, but that doesn't negate the need uh, to meet the resolution of the Senate in respect of uh, responding to those. I'd just like to draw the Chamber's attention to the President's report uh, to the Senate on the status of government responses to parliamentary committee reports. And at the moment, um, we have a situation where uh, uh, 246 um, uh, reports are in the President's report, of which there are 205 outstanding responses from government. So 205 reports out of uh, 246 uh, have not been responded to. Uh, and uh, it, I remind the government that uh, you know, the Senate uh, and, and indeed the parliament initiate inquiries, and they do so as they uh, seek to represent uh, their constituents. Uh, the, 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 the parliament or the Senate calls for submissions, which, which take a lot of work. A lot of people put a lot of time and effort into submissions that, come, uh, that get returned to the parliament. And then, of course, we go to places at, uh, at taxpayers' expense, uh, and sometimes they come to us at their expense uh, to allow us to hear from these people. And, of course, there's a, a considerable amount of work that is done by the secretariat and the committees themselves in respect of developing uh, committee reports, coherent reports. Uh, and, uh, when I say that time has been spent, I, I talk about time that's been spent by both government senators, by opposition senators and, indeed, senators on the crossbench. Um, I appreciate that the government might all, not, not always uh, uh, have an affinity with, it, with, with recommendations, and they have the ability to, to respond uh, rejecting those recommendations, but uh, certainly there is a moral responsibility for government to respond to uh, these in, all of these inquiries, noting that they, in some sense, in, in doing so, they're not being respectful to the people, and, and in my view, they're also uh, not meeting a constitutional obligation to respond to uh, the parliament. And it's uh, in that vein, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that uh, uh, Minister Birmingham has indicated that we might get a response by the end of this year. But I do draw. The, the, uh, the Chamber's attention to the fact that there are so many other reports that have simply not been responded to by government. Uh, Senator Fruke, you know, I'm just going to remind senators, I'm not sure how many speakers we have uh, interested in this matter, but we do have a hard marker at 3.30. Senator Faruqi. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the government's continued failure to front up to the PFAS-affected communities that they have abandoned. Nearly a month ago, I told the Senate that every day the government delays responding to this report shows its contempt not only for the Senate but for the thousands of people who have lived with contamination of their land and their water caused by the government. Well, here we are again, nearly a year since the Senate report into PFAS contamination was tabled in this place and no response whatsoever from the government. No justification really for the delay. Yes, we all understand it's a complex issue, but we deal with complex issues every single day. And saying that you intend to release the report by the end of the year, frankly, is not good enough. Um, there is no commitment really to bring justice and closure to the victims of this contamination. It's important to appreciate, I think, how we've reached this point. When the report was tabled last December, I said if the government cares about the community, if they care about our environment, they should urgently accept the recommendations of the report. They don't have to wait for months to provide a response, but months they waited. In January, I visited communities in Williamtown, Salt Ash and Bob's Farm areas, where residents are really sick and tired of having to fight the federal government for compensation for the pollution of their land and water by the Department of Defense. They are really exhausted. They too were calling on the government to respond with a proper compensation package that importantly must include buybacks of properties that have been significantly affected. Still, the government was silent. In July, this place passed my motion that ordered the government to release a response. This order for production of documents passed the Senate after it had been more than seven months since the Joint Standing Committee tabled its reports. Seven more months of effective affected communities waiting anxiously. Still, the government ignored the Senate's call and worried residents around the country. 
By September, I said enough was enough and moved with others in this place to order the government to table their response. Not only did the government fail to respond, they told this chamber they didn't even have a response to give. They've had the committee recommendations in front of them for almost one year now, and they still don't have a response to give us. What a slap in the face of the communities who have waited more than long enough, communities that have suffered more than long enough, communities that deserve concrete action. Not now, but years ago. That action should have come years ago. Just last month in October, I spoke with the Hawkesbury Environment Network about contamination in Richmond and around New South Wales. I also visited the so-called Red Zone in Williamtown, where PFAS-affected residents have been left in limbo by state and federal governments and the Department of Defense, who it seems don't give a damn. Lyndon Drisdale was one of the citizens I met. After our meeting, she told Port Stevens examiner, the big people, the politicians in Canberra, don't listen to us little people. We are the ones who are living this nightmare 24-7, and we are not going to stop fighting, even if it means till the death. We are with the residents of Williamtown, the residents of Richmond, and communities around the country this government is leaving hanging out to dry. Such is the absolute justified frustration of community members that late last month they launched the largest class action Australia has ever seen. Up to 40,000 people who live and work on the land contaminated by PFAS are taking the government to court to demand justice for the harm this contamination has done to their property values that now traps them in an incredibly dangerous situation. Every day that this government slows down the process, every day that they deny compensation to communities who deserve solid action, the lack of action drives affected people further into the ground financially. Not only that, the lack of action has impacted people's mental and physical well-being immensely. These communities did nothing wrong. Their land was contaminated by the Department of Defense, but the community is expected now to bear the cost of living with PFAS contamination. You have the luxury of sitting here, wasting time and obfuscating, but they don't. People are at breaking point. The government needs to take action, and it needs to take action now. It is the height of arrogance for this government to refuse to respond to the community and also a Senate inquiry. Ultimately, the federal government must take responsibility for the PFAS pollution. The community has waited and suffered long enough. It's time for action. Thousands of lives have been changed by the PFAS contamination, pushing communities to breaking point. Government neglect has forced people to wait for too long. The government must immediately release their response to the PFAS report. Senator, Mama, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to, to again uh, condemn this government in its slow response to an inquiry that has impacted so many Australians across this country. In particular, uh, the inquiry went to the places in the Northern Territory, uh, in Queensland and in New South Wales, and to all those families out there who are still waiting for a respectful response. Well, it's too late, isn't it, Madam Deputy President? It was actually in December 2017 when we stood in this chamber to agree to a subcommittee. At 2017, December 2017, we are coming up to December 2019. It is not good enough for our parliament to not respond to the hundreds of families to all of those who gave evidence. They demand the respect from this parliament. People are devastated. People are hurting. And we cannot even give a response because the government has not even considered it. I'd like to just, in the short time that I have, just remind uh, senators just what we reported on as deputy chair of the PFAS subcommittee and with the chair, Mr Andrew Lamming, MP. Our report contains significant recommendations with a focus on improving the government's response to this issue, particularly in relation to the concerns of the affected communities that I have mentioned. 
The committee has re recommended a coordinator general be appointed with the authority and resources necessary to more effectively coordinate the whole of Commonwealth government effort in respect of PFAS contamination and to ensure a clear and consistent approach to community consultations and to cooperation with state, territory and local governments. The committee also made recommendations to improve the voluntary blood testing program as a source of longitudinal information on the long-term health effects of PFAS exposure and the effectiveness of measures to break PFAS exposure pathways. In many instances, property owners in the PFAS contaminated areas, and we know where they are across this country, and I certainly know where they are in the Northern Territory, PFAS contaminated areas have suffered demonstrable and quantifiable financial losses, and the committee recommended compensation. It isn't difficult to respond to those recommendations. It's not good enough. It is not good enough that two years to when we began this subcommittee PFAS inquiry into these concerns across the country, the government still has not responded. Thank you, um, Senator McCarthy. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to taking note of answers. Senator um, Stirl, just before you rise, I'll just remind senators now that the hard marker now applies to taking note. <clears throat> Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher and Senator Wong. And before I do, Minister, um, I want to share with you a catastrophe with this nation is finding itself in. I'm actually glad that there's some grown-ups across the chamber in uh, Senator uh, uh, Brockman as well and uh, Senator Stoker. This is serious stuff. Now, we know there's a slowdown and we know that wages growth is, is pretty poor, but we have a dilemma in this nation in the trucking industry. We have in this nation a very simple thing called the modern awards. Now, we all know how they work, and for years I've argued for everything that I could get for tra transport workers to be higher than the modern award, because I don't think it's all that great. But be it as it is, there is a law of the land that says thou shall pay X amount of pesos per hour or whatever it might be, or cents per kilometre in the long distance award, and no one argues. You don't argue, we don't argue. Everyone in this nation is touched by transport, road transport. Senator Brockman, your family farm would have had a very close affinity to tr road transport. There's no argument. Whatever we eat, whatever we wear, you name it, everything comes on the back of a truck. Everything's delivered except maybe the odd baby here and there. But when we have serious, and my desk is full of examples of companies not even meeting the basic modern award, wage theft in this nation is exploding. Now, we've heard some pretty bad examples, some slip-ups through computers, i.e. Woolworths, 300 million. A couple of chefs have been a little bit shaky on what they've paid, we know, and they're self-nominating and dobbing themselves in. Great, tremendous. But it is exploitation 101 in the road transport industry. And the worst part about the exploitation and the wage theft in the road transport industry is the employers themselves, who a majority of them are not bad people. But they are being squeezed the living daylights out of them from the top of the supply chain. Now, if you go to your employers and say, are you paying your people right? Every employer will say, yep, everything's cool with me. They're not going to own up to doing the wrong thing. The truth of the matter is I don't think it's unreasonable for hard-working men and women, whether they are drivers or whether they are forkies, whether they are owner drivers or whether they are employ drivers and employ subcontractors. I don't think it's an unfair thing for them to be at least remunerated by what is the basic law in this land. Now, I've got examples here that have just absolutely I'm gobsmacked. And, and Minister, you need to take this on board because you have friends in the trucking industry as well. Because I know who they are because they're my friends as well. But I have got one classic example here that cannot go, and this is only one. There are heaps of them. This is a job advertisement on SEEK. And, it's and they're, they're calling out for a HR, which he is a heavy rigid, heavy rigid truck driver with ABN. 
Let that sink in for those who don't know the industrial laws of the land. You cannot have an employee driver with an ABN. It is completely and totally against the law. It is actually. Oh, sorry, Senator McMahon. And so you too. And this touches your state, Senator McMahon. McMahon and, and how important road transport is in the territory. I know that was my old run, Perth to Darwin, for all those years. But this is called scam contracting. Minister, this is not me running some argument that my union, who I'm a life member of, wants me to go in there and just give you a tickle up. This is serious stuff. This is people out there trying to do the right thing before I even start talking about road safety. But this, this mob in Queensland, QLS Logistics, I wouldn't know them from a bar of soap. I don't want to know QLS Logistics unless I had the ability to go out there and prosecute them. But they're asking for this truck driver with an ABN to deliver multi-drops to Queensland country region. The driver will need to operate the truck and dog and have a current BFM, which is basic fatigue management certificate, to be able to drive 12 hours a day. That's not against the law. You can do that. Late model Mercedes Benz auto shift truck provided. Truck provided. Oh, hey, that wonderful. They're providing a truck for you. Trucks are hand unloaded at stores and the trolley by the driver, with deliveries to major retail and wholesale outlets through the country Queensland area. All deliveries will be brown and white goods. Furniture. Okay, great. Person to be physically fit. Yep, you would expect that. Applicants must have an ABN. Immediate start, $300 plus GST day rate. Runs will be five to six days long, guaranteed each week. You cannot do this by law. And you know what? No one gives a fat rat's bottom. There is nobody policing this. The, the fair work ombudsman is asleep at the wheel. The fair work ombudsman likes to take the easy stuff where you can get out there and ping 7-Eleven or whatever they're called. Isn't someone going to stand up for our trucking people? This cannot stay. This cannot remain. And we want to start talking about road safety. I'm pleading with you, Minister. Oh, something has uh, to be sorry, done. Sorry, Senator Stirl, time has expired. What a Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Senator Stirl, I um, I share your your interest and your concern to make sure that people who are working in trucking have have safe and fair working conditions. It's entirely important. Um, I'm a little bit of a loss to see um, or to recall Senators Gallagher or Wong asking anything about the trucking industry in, in, the, course of their, um, in the course of their questions today. And uh, so I might help you out by bringing you back to what Senators Gallagher and Wong asked about today, and that was about the economic indicators that um, we have in this country. And there was a concern expressed in the course of those questions about wage growth in this country. And um, it's understandable that people are interested in wage growth. It goes to the, the take home pay of all Australians. And um, you'll notice that you know, I'm not getting carried away, I'm not getting cocky. This is, this is serious stuff, things that we should um, not get inflammatory or theatrical about. It, it matters too much to the lives of Australians for us to be um, carrying on and scoring political points. So let's, let's break it down to the facts. We know that inflation over the last year, or over the September quarter, has been 1.7 per cent. That's not high. But importantly, the wage price index exceeds that number. Over the same period, September quarter of 2019, it rose by 2.2 per cent. So what does that mean, Madam Deputy President? Well, it means that while people's wages went up a little, the cost of living went up less. Um, it means that people in net terms got a little bit ahead. Now, did they get a lot ahead? Did it? Did they? earn a whole lot more than the cost of living went up. They, they earned a little bit more than the cost of living went up. Uh, but the important thing is that growth in wages exceeded inflation. It meant Australians got ahead. Now, would I like the difference between those two numbers so that Australians were, were earning a whole lot more? Um, oh, of course I'd like to see Australians earn more. But we should remember that if we have wage growth that enormously outstrips inflation, it does have an impact on pushing the price of everything up. And so this can become a little bit circular. If we reach the point where um, just by 
having runaway wages, we just push up the, the cost of living enormously, it doesn't get Australians ahead. And so to have a, a steady as she goes, measured, sensible approach is actually not bad in circumstances where we have other advanced economies facing challenges to wages growth, other advanced economies facing um, slower growth than they have had across their economy, and in circumstances where we face challenges as a nation um, in relation to dealing with drought, which has enormously um, hit our rural sector, then um, we aren't doing too badly against that, that global picture and against those local challenges. In that context, it's important to point to the huge investment we have made in infrastructure to help Australian um, people have access to more work, to see more, more stimulation of our economy. And there has been $100 billion in a pipeline of infrastructure that is to have an enormous impact across this country. And it isn't just the stimulus that comes from that spending itself, but the economic opportunity that is unlocked by the fact of these strategically chosen projects because of the way that they empower other businesses to grow, the way that they open up the potential for other projects to grow. And then once we add to that enormous infrastructure pipeline of projects that are happening now across this country, Order. then we can also look to the stimulus effect of drought support in rural communities that are doing it tough. And we have put forward a record package of assistance for people who are trying to deal with the impact of drought. Since the last budget, we have committed an additional $355 million to step up yet again our drought response, and that means we can add to the more than billion Thank dollars you, since Senator the election. Thank you, Senator your time has expired. Thank Senator Carr. Thank you, uh, Macken, Deputy President. The government uh, has clearly been mugged by economic reality. The government clearly has no plan, has no agenda, and is running on fumes. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer assure us all is well and things may even get better. <clears throat> We've heard from the Leader of the Government today, apart from a few international headwinds, it's all pretty good. And that's been their line since before the election. Now, the real economy doesn't match their rosy story. Wages are flatlining. So are retail sales. Household debt is not shrinking. Unemployment rates is stuck around 5 per cent. And all of this is happening despite the fact we have record, historically record low interest rates, and of course we have the much vaulted tax cuts. The traditional stimulus measures, at least uh, the ones the government has tried, are simply not working. The tax cuts have not resulted in increased consumer spending. Companies are not investing in new production. Research and development has fallen away massively. It's no wonder that the Prime Minister has said to his uh, party room he wanted to get politics off the front page. No wonder he said that he wants ministers to engage less with controversy. It's no wonder that, of course, we want to maintain this fairy tale that this is all going to happen. And Morris, Mr Morrison and Mr Frydenberg are desperately trying to shut down dissenting voices. And most notably, they want to shut down the voice of the research, the Reserve Bank Governor, Philip Lowe. We heard today, well, of course, the government respects the independence of the Reserve Bank. Well, of course, that's not reflected on the front page of The Australian today, where the chairman of the government's uh, Parliamentary Committee, House of Representatives Committee, has attacked the Governor of the Reserve Bank and, of course, is part of a consistent pattern of abuse of the Reserve Bank. And, of course, in a world first for the Australia Post, a letter written on Tuesday managed to get to the Australian within a couple of hours. Talk about Express Post. Mr Wilson must have walked it around to the editorial suite of the Australian to get it done in that time. 
We are, of course, have here for five years been told by the Reserve Bank that monetary policy alone cannot rescue this economy from the doldrums. It's called for stimulus measures, including investment in infrastructure. We've been told that we should invest in stimulus measures rather than rely on interest rates cuts to make this happen. Now, of course, this government has sought to nobble the Reserve Bank. Mr Lowe has been told he's been tried to be embarrassed and humiliated by having to appear at press conferences with the Treasurer in a manner in which the Royal Commissioner would never do. But the Reserve Bank Governor has been nobbled and has been, he's, he's been thugged into making sure he does not make comment on economic policy. The mild-mannered Reserve Bank Governor, of course, has been put on this government's hit list because he proposes quite clearly reasonable measures in the light of the extraordinary economic circumstances, and this Treasurer has decided to call Mr Lowe to heel. And of course, we now know the consequences. The economic statistics are simply as this. The quiet Australians will not remain quiet. The reality in the real economy is that the government's measures are failing and the undermining the Reserve Bank independence and the, and the attempt to silence independent voices will not change the facts when it comes to what families are experiencing, what, what it really means to have low wages what it really means to have high increases in the cost of living, what it really means in terms of understanding the economic hardship that's being felt by families right across this country. Thank it will, you, of course, uh, see Senator real Carr. anger from Senator real Australians. Carr, please resume your seat. The time for this debate has expired. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Stirl be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Pursuant to order, we'll now do the consideration of disallowance motions. I call the